Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Tuesday, January 18th. Here's some of what we're talking about tonight. The Senate has begun debating two voting rights bills, but there is little debate that the bills will fail. New polling might show a path forward for building support among the American people. Then... So let's be clear. Our view is this is an extremely dangerous situation. We're now at a stage where Russia could at any point launch an attack in Ukraine. The White House is warning that a Russian war against Ukraine may only be a matter of time. The Secretary of State is still focused on a peace plan. A former U.S. ambassador to Russia joins us just ahead. Microsoft makes a $68 billion bet on a video game company that's facing allegations of sexual harassment. What's in the future for Activision Blizzard? And what will it mean for some of the world's most popular games? Also, Verizon and AT&T scale back their 5G launches. Airline warn that the technology will cause chaos for passengers. We'll have what you need to know before you travel. And forget about Wordle. The New York Times crossword is looking for new talent. You'll see how the paper hopes to make its design team more diverse. Well, they are working late in Washington as we come on the air tonight. The U.S. Senate is still debating those two voting rights bills on the Senate floor as we speak. And speeches on both sides of the aisle have made one thing clear. The Democrats are facing an uphill battle, to say the least. Senate Democrats are under no illusion that we face difficult odds, especially when virtually every Senate Republican, every Senate Republican is staunchly against legislation protecting the right to vote. Win, lose, or draw, members of this chamber were elected to debate and to vote, especially on an issue as vital to the beating heart of our democracy as voting rights. Washington Democrats have wanted the power to rewrite the rules for political speech and election laws long, long before the events that are supposed to justify it. We have strong disagreements about the substance of these bills, but even more broadly, we see decreasing trust in our dem democracy among both political sides. So Republicans say they disagree with the substance of the bills, and Democrats are voting on them anyway, planning to, knowing they will probably fail, painting it as a duty to their constituents. Now, both the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act target restrictive laws passed across the country last year, and you can see on this map where some of those laws came from. Now, so far, only Senate Democrats are publicly supporting these bills at all. They would need 10 Republican votes, at least, to avoid a filibuster. Tonight, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer confirmed that he will put forward a proposal to change Senate rules. The change would allow a talking filibuster on the legislation. That's that old-fashioned filibuster where members would actually have to keep talking and talking to hold the bill up. Making that change will require all 50 Democrats to support it, but these two senators, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, have said they oppose that change. Now, to be clear, the two of them have said they do support the voting rights bills themselves, but not at the expense of the current save-your-breath filibuster system. Now, the Senate is expected to vote on those two bills tomorrow, but what can we expect to see after that? Let's begin tonight with NBC senior congressional correspondent Garrett Hake. And Garrett, I wonder if anything has come out in the speeches tonight on the Senate floor that's unexpected, or have we mostly heard what we expected to hear? Mostly what we expected, Joshua. I think we've seen the rhetoric really get ratcheted up even to another high level tonight. I was at that news conference with Leader Schumer an hour and a half ago, uh, and he laid the fact that they're even in this position at the feet of Republicans, who he said, you know, essentially betrayed uh, their commitment to the country and to voting rights to not even be willing to engage in serious discussions on these voting rights bills, leaving it just to Democrats to try to find some way to pass them. But as you just laid up, that pathway is not forthcoming for Democrats. We expect the vote tomorrow on the legislation itself to fail 50-50 with every Democrat in favor, every Republican opposed. And then there's this rule change that the leader laid out, trying to find this Goldilocks position here that might be enough of a change to pass these bills, but not enough of a change to irritate Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, who might then vote against it. And Joshua, everything we can tell tonight, uh, they're still planning to vote against that rule change, which means 
these bills are going nowhere. It's just a question of whether they sort of die tomorrow or on Thursday. Can you clarify, though, in terms of this, this filibuster? I mean, I, I think it's kind of... Uh, startling to some folks that you don't have to talk to filibuster a bill anymore. That rule just kind of changed as opposed to the old Mr. Smith goes to Washington, Patton Oswald and Parks and Rec filibuster where you have to keep yakking right. to hold a bill up. Have they said why they don't want even that kind of a filibuster? I mean, it's a, it's a throwback. It's not a new kind of filibuster at all. If anything, what we have now is the new version. No. Right. It's not even that you don't have to stop talking. It's that you don't even have to start. I mean, what we've seen evolve over time here is filibustering what's called the motion to proceed, which is the vote that happens even to start debate on a bill. So a senator or a party might say, look, we're going to block this motion to proceed and no debate even starts. Usually the majority party just says it's not worth it to, to hold a failed vote and they move on. So the filibuster has is a tool that's existed for a long time, but its strength is only increased. Now, in terms of the idea of making it a talking filibuster, this gets really technical, but basically the question is, does it end, if you were to go to a talking filibuster, does it end when the minority party stops talking, or does it end when the minority party stops talking and the majority party still is able to get a super majority of votes? This is where Joe Manchin makes reporters like me want to pull our hair out because he'll say things all the time like, oh, I support a talking filibuster, and that makes Democrats rush out and say, oh, my God, there's a, there's a lane here. And then he'll say, oh, but I don't, I don't support ending it uh, with just a majority vote. It's got to be harder than that. And then all of a sudden we all go right back to the drawing board. So it has been challenging to follow the bouncing ball on this, but it seems like the, the bar for Manchin, and to the degree we understand her thinking cinema too, isn't how you construct the filibuster, it's that it would take 60 votes, presumably a bipartisan number in any configuration of the modern Senate to end debate and actually pass something. Yeah, please do not start pulling out your hair. You could end up with something like mine, and that would be very strange. Thank you, Gary. That's NBC <laughs> senior congressional that. correspondent. Yeah, that would, I don't know if the bureau chief would appreciate that. That's NBC senior congressional correspondent, Garrett Hake, starting us off tonight. Much appreciated. Now, as Garrett said, it's pretty safe to say that these voting rights bills will not become law, at least not right now, without a big shift in Congress. President Biden put voting rights at the top of his agenda last week, but Americans might consider that too little too late. Check out this survey from this month from Politico and Morning Consult. It shows that 31% of Americans strongly disapprove of the president's job performance on voting rights. 18% strongly approve. There's obviously a range in the middle. And again, this is just on voting rights specifically, not his overall job performance. Activists and many Democrats have been calling out restrictive voting measures for a while. So, is this just a matter of bad strategy? Perhaps the bills could be salvaged with a new approach. Well, yesterday, the Gallup poll released an update to its regular surveys on America's political trends. We mentioned this yesterday, but at the start of 2021, Gallup found that most voters leaned Democratic, or said they did, by nine percentage points. By the end of the year, the Republicans were up by five points. Now combine that shift with an ongoing trend. Gallup also found that most Americans describe themselves as moderate or conservative. They're basically tied. Self-described liberals are by far the smallest group, have been for decades, though that group is slowly growing. And maybe that's the issue with bills like these. Perhaps they seem like left-leaning legislation to a nation that leans more to the right, if it leans at all. Now, granted, voting rights used to be a bipartisan issue in Congress, but could a more moderate approach have given these bills a stronger chance? Is it too late? Let's continue now with Susan Del Percio. She's a Republican strategist and MSNBC political analyst. Susan, it's good to see you again. Welcome. Great to be with you, Joshua. First of all, can I just get your sense of the strategy thus far, at least in light of the latest polling, in light of what we're seeing tonight on Capitol Hill? What's your, your view of the strategy that's kind of led up to tonight? Well, there's a few things in play here. I mean, if it was just about what the people wanted, we've seen issues that are what we call 80-20 issues, like gun control or gun background checks for buyers. And 
they overly or they're overwhelmingly supported in the public, but it's gotten nowhere in the House or Senate because of Republicans. So what we see now is in yet another issue in a very divided con uh, country. And I think there may have been more room for the John Lewis Voting Act, Voting Act which was really about preclearance and returning back to the 1965 Voting Rights Act and those provisions. But even now, it looks like the only thing that we have as far as voting rights is maybe bipartisan support for the Electoral uh, Count Act, which goes back to 1887, which could do some revising, as we saw as a result of January 6th. But the other thing at play is when you look at the Republicans, especially in the Senate, keep in mind, the only thing that keeps them viable and strong to their donors not the public, but the donors, is that they stick as one. They're 50. They're not 48. They're not 45. They're 50. They are a strong minority in the Senate right now. And when you have that coupled with two Democratic senators who have made it very clear there will be no carve-out for the filibuster, that's it. That's game over. No amount of messaging can fix those two things. Do you think that there is a more moderate or more conservative case to be made for those two bills? I hear you in terms of like the Voting Rights Act and the Electoral College Act. So basically we're either, you know, going back to laws in the 1960s or the 1880s. But I, I think it kind of makes a lot of progressives pretty upset that there is no path forward, at least right now, for advancing a bill to improve, as they see it, improve voter enfranchisement. But is there even a case to be made on those bills to moderates and to conservatives? There is a case. I think it's maybe a little too late now. And I know this is going to get some of your viewers upset. But here's the truth of the matter. People need to understand what's at stake. And it is not like the 1960s in people's views. So it's not that people can't vote. And we have to start you know, softening that message if that's what you want you know, when we talk about becoming more moderate. What it is is that people who, frankly, look like me, it's easier for me to vote than people who look like you. It doesn't take six hours of waiting in line. There's not in inherent discrimination in the process. And that's something that we can maybe break down a little bit further for moderate and conservatives, is that there's an issue of fairness at play. We shouldn't be limiting how people how often people, or not how often, excuse me, how people vote. We should be expanding it. Drop boxes are good. They've been proven secure. Non-excuse um, absentee ballots are a good thing for states as long as they go through the right process. But right now, we're so far from that conversation, I just don't think it makes it through. I wonder what you think of this. Feel free to tell me I'm crazy if you think this is crazy and you can see the conversation or the debate going on right now on the Senate floor as it may well continue for a little while during this program. I wonder, Susan, if perhaps Jill Manchin and Kirsten Cinema had to be the impediment to this bill. I mean, if, if I had these two moderates and I understand the political complexion of the country that there's a larger share of moderates, self-described moderates than self-described liberals in this country and has been for decades. I wonder if there was some way maybe to leverage them, to use them to help make the case to moderates for the need to have legislation like this. I, I, I always felt like, I don't know if that strategy of making them the problem is actually going to work. It seems like there might be a way to make the obstacle the way forward for these bills. But we also know that the two of them have been rather opaque about what they've wanted in the past. I don't know. Do you think there's more of a way that they could have been used to move these bills forward? I wish I could have your optimism. I really do, <laughs> because I do believe in good governance and good government. And that's what we need right now. And for some reason, those two Democratic senators, along with 50 other Republicans, don't see the need for that and don't even want to get there, Joshua. And that's the problem. They are dug in. Now, that's not to say they're not alone. I don't know what happens when push comes to shove on the filibuster issue if they're the only two no votes, by the way. But they have made it so clear that it's not even worth pursuing. So I wish different messaging could have gotten us there. But unless it's in 
without bipartisan support, which all along has been Joe Manchin's specific objection, without bipartisan right. support, he will not go in to a uh, voting rights bill, meaning he wanted 60. By the way, 60 used to be a good thing. It meant that we were building consensus. Now it just prevents us from getting anywhere, which is why the carve out. But you're not getting Joe Manchin there, that's for sure. Susan Del Percio, I appreciate you talking this through with us tonight. Good to see you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come, some wireless companies are changing their course on the nationwide 5G rollout. Airlines have been making some dire warnings about catastrophic consequences. So what does all of this mean for your next flight? We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. So how safe will it be to fly this week when 5G service expands tomorrow? We have a big update in the standoff between airlines and wireless providers. Today, AT&T and Verizon agreed to delay the rollout near certain airports. Yesterday, airline executives warned that not doing this could be, in their words, catastrophic. Ben Minicucci is the CEO of Alaska Airlines. Today, he told my colleague Hallie Jackson that this is only a temporary solution. It rests on the FAA to do the analysis. And uh, this is a complex problem. Uh, the FAA has to go airport by airport, runway by runway, and do an analysis to clear these runways at airports so that we can safely fly. Now, President Biden weighed in on this, too. He thanked Verizon and AT&T for the delay, and he praised this agreement for protecting flight safety. He also reiterated that, quote, expanding 5G and promoting competition in Internet service are critical priorities, unquote. NBC aviation correspondent Tom Costello joins us now from Washington Reagan National Airport. Tom, this seems like a mess. How did this get so far out of hand where you've got one industry pointing fingers at the other industry, government leaders trying to work everything out? How did this get so messy? And listen, you had uh, real anger between the FCC and the FAA, right? Two, uh, or two agencies within the same administration, they were really also at each other's throats. And by the way, this predates the Biden administration. This has been going on for years. This rivalry between the FCC and the FAA, a concern between the airlines and the, and the cell phone industry and the Biden and Trump administrations, uh, Republicans and Democrats really got into this kind of a paralyzing fight. And it finally boiled down to the airline CEO sending a letter yesterday saying you either resolve this right now or there will be mass chaos. That caused the White House to get involved and that's when finally AT&T and Verizon decided okay, they blinked and they went ahead and, and decided they will not activate those, those sites near the airports. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of time for pointing fingers later on, but is there any sense that maybe a cue was missed, somebody didn't respond to an email? Like, this seems like the kind of thing that if everybody had just been on the same page all along, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Well, the trouble is that you had you had these two different sides with competing agendas and and candidly with with competing political agendas. So there wasn't one email. I mean, this goes. I've talked to both sides. They both blame each other. Uh, the, the bottom line is the the aviation industry felt like the cell phone industry wasn't listening to their concerns. The cell phone industry was convinced the aviation industry was blowing it out all out of proportion and they weren't listening to the science out of Europe. The aviation community said, why do we care about how this or d does or doesn't affect planes in Europe? We want to know how it affects planes in the United States. So they, they were at an impasse. And honestly, it's unusual to see two agencies really at each other's throats like this. So let's talk about what happens now, particularly for airports across the country. Originally, there were buffer zones around 50 airports. The letter from airline execs yesterday said that was not enough. So what is this going to mean for airports across the U.S.? 
Well, the bottom line is right now, because AT&T and Verizon are not going to turn on these 5G cell sites near airports, nothing's changed, right? If you're flying into any one of these airports, it should be business as normal, as usual. In the meantime, uh, the FAA is trying to determine how sensitive every specific plane's altimeters are to this 5G system. Before they ever approve 5G to go live around airports, they need to know which altimeters might be sensitive, which aren't. That is looking at something like a dozen different altimeter models on a whole variety of planes dating back years and years and years. Eventually, could we get to a point where certain airlines have to replace certain altimeters on planes? Yeah, that's a possibility. Or we get to a point where the FAA is comfortable with these planes flying in to 5G airports, or AT&T and Verizon turn down the power on those cell sites near the airports. All of that is right now up for discussion, and we don't have a timeline about how long this will take. And can we just be clear, Tom, in terms of what the concern is? You mentioned these altimeters, the, the sensitive instruments on board the airplane. The concern is that 5G would interfere with them. We've been told for years, turn off your phone, put it in airplane mode before you get on a flight, you land, and they say you can take it out of airplane mode. What is the actual concern? Can you just bottom line that too? Like, is the fear that planes yeah. could crash, could fall out of the sky, could miss the runways? Like, what is the worst case scenario here? Well, uh, so to be clear, we're not talking about whatever interference your phone might cause. We're talking about the fifth generation of cell phones. That's why it's called 5G rolling out at midnight tonight. It is a much more powerful uh, signal and uh, it is operating on a, on a radio spectrum that is very, very close to the radio spectrum used by altimeters. Now, altimeters are critical. They provide the pilot with accurate data on how far he or she is from the runway when they're coming in for a landing, right? They give them an accurate amount of distance they are from the runway. Critical when you're coming in for a, in a bad weather landing. If you don't have the altimeter or if the altimeter is getting interfered with and therefore you don't have good data, then you could understand why that poses an immediate safety risk. And that's why the FAA said, until we understand specifically how much interference these altimeters uh, may receive from 5G, we're simply not going to allow pilots to fly into airports using altimeters if 5G is active. Thankfully now, 5G not active at the airports, and so uh, planes can operate as, as usual, but they've got to figure this out before they go any further with opening up these sites around airports. So I just want to repeat what Tom just said. 5G is not active around these airports. For now, there is this kind of uh, delay, a standoff, really, is, is what it is for the moment. Before I let you go, Tom, what's the timeline from here? When is the next big decision to be made in this whole process? Well, I think that's really opaque right now. We just simply don't know. We don't, you know, the airlines were not specific on how long they would put this plan on hold. They have said, and the FCC and FAA have said, the FAA has got to do the due diligence to figure out if there is a problem. And you don't rush the FAA on something like this. And the big uh, plane makers are involved. Boeing and Airbus, Honeywell, for example, is also involved. This is a process, but we don't know if it's going to take three months, three years. Uh, we simply don't know at this point. You're 5G will still go active tonight. If you're if you're excited about that somewhere in the country, your 5G will go will go active, but not around an airport. NBC Aviation correspondent Tom Costello walking us through this standoff. Tom, thank you very much. You bet. Up next, we turn from the planes in the air to the games in our hands. Microsoft says it will buy the troubled video game giant behind Candy Crush and Call of Duty. The latest on Activision Blizzard, including plans to deal with toxic workplace concerns. That's just ahead. Stay close. We have been following the troubles of one of the world's top video game studios, the company behind Candy Crush and Call of Duty. Now that story has taken a turn for the better, worse, maybe neither. Hard to say what the future holds for Activision Blizzard, except that it's about to get a new owner. Today, Microsoft announced that it will buy the studio for nearly $70 billion cash. The tech giant released a statement welcoming Activision and its legendary franchises to Microsoft Gaming. Microsoft is the company behind the Xbox gaming console. This would be its largest acquisition ever and the biggest cash-funded takeover since the start of the pandemic. 
I say would be because it still needs approval from both companies' boards and from federal regulators. Activision Blizzard has been addressing concerns of sexual misconduct and discrimination. A statement from Microsoft reads in part, quote, Microsoft is committed to our journey for inclusion in every aspect of gaming among both employees and players. We deeply value individual studio cultures. We also believe that creative success and autonomy go hand in hand with treating every person with dignity and respect, unquote. Then there is the matter of Activision's current leaders, one of whom has been under fire over all this. According to the Wall Street Journal, the studio CEO, Bobby Kotick, reportedly knew about sexual misconduct allegations within the company, but did not tell the board. Back in September, Activision settled a discrimination and harassment lawsuit from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission for $18 million. It remains under scrutiny from the Securities and Exchange Commission and from the state of California. A statement from Activision says that it has pushed out or disciplined more than 80 employees since July to address these kinds of allegations. On top of all of that, a number of employees have walked off the job in protest. They claim that Activision Blizzard has mistreated some of their contractors, and that situation is still developing. Meanwhile, Bobby Kotick will remain Activision CEO, at least for now. The Journal reports that he will leave once the deal is done. Joining us now is Shannon Liao. She's been covering this story for The Washington Post. Ms. Liao, welcome. Good to have you with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. What are some of the early reactions to the news of this acquisition? Positive, negative, mixed, nonplussed? What's the reaction been like? I think the overall reaction from, you know, people in the games industry, employees, Activision Blizzard has just been shock. Everyone has been saying, you know, wow, they are... Uh, really confused. They never saw this could happen. Um, maybe 20 years ago, they might be ha might, might have been playing Activision Blizzard games. They might have been, you know, using Microsoft computers, but they never thought they could come together and be one company. So it's just been overall shock and confusion across the industry. Now, the Post has been doing some reporting on how Microsoft plans to address the concerns within Activision Blizzard. What do we know about that? Right. So, you know, uh, Microsoft has said that they think that Activision Blizzard is, you know, working on the culture concerns. Last year, they issued a, you know, zero tolerance policy against harassment. So in, in those words, Microsoft today said that it was, you know, accepting and, and thinking that uh, Activision Blizzard is doing, is doing well. Um, however, we don't actually know, you know, if Microsoft were to buy Activision Blizzard, if that deal completes, um, how does that actually change the culture inside the company? Will uh, you know people still come up with uh, these sexual harassment complaints and these workplace discrimination allegations, or are they going to actually materially feel a different change from the new management at the company? And so, since we don't know that, um, all we have are the words that Microsoft has said, which is that you know they think Activision Blizzard has done a good job and is actually making progress. Which you know, again, we don't know if that's true. What about the regulatory hurdles, potentially? I mean, Microsoft made a big acquisition last year, acquiring the studio behind a new game that came out called Deathloop, which has been very successful, parental advisory, hyper-violent, in case your kids are asking for it. But what about that, the possibility that regulators might say, sorry, this is just too big of an acquisition for us to, to permit? Right. I've spoken to analysts asking them, you know, what's the likelihood of this deal being completed? And they did say that, you know, if Microsoft, which has Xbox and Xbox Game Pass, signs these exclusive deals with Activision Blizzard and says, you know, all these games, Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, Overwatch, Starcraft, and Candy Crush have to be exclusive to Xbox platforms and to Windows PCs, then, you know, cutting out the competition of PlayStation consoles or Nintendo uh, consoles, that could be an antitrust issue. And if that were to happen, then, of course, the Federal Trade Commission, the, the DOJ can take a look at this and say that that's not, um, you know, something that they want to approve. Um, of course, if Xbox and, and Windows uh, don't uh, do that and leave this to be open, it might not be such an antitrust issue. So that is one potential, like, regulatory scrutiny that Microsoft could face in this entire situation. A few more things I want to ask you before I have to let you go. First of all, the exclusivity in games doesn't make sense to me. I mean, movie studios, television studios have learned that the more clients you have for your business, the more money you make. Deathloop was a PlayStation exclusive. Microsoft makes the Xbox. So what are they going to do? Pull it off the PlayStation, drop it on the Xbox? It just seems like it has the potential to cost Microsoft money that they don't have to lose and also just make gamers crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, they, uh, this is an interesting video game company strategy that has been gone on for years. Um, you know, console makers actually sell each console at a loss. So when they're making these hardware, um, they're not actually expecting profit back from each unit. They're actually waiting for gamers to buy lots of software and paying $60 per game, like Deathloop, for instance. And then over time, um, you know, from the software, Microsoft and PlayStation can make the money back. Uh, so that's why they have these exclusive deals. And Sony, for instance, is like the nom number one dominant console maker because they have such uh, prominent PS5, PS4, PlayStation exclusives like um, you know Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War. These are just games that people keep coming back to and, and playing right. more of. And Spider-Man, Miles Morales, for instance. So that's why you know Xbox uh, is trying to also go around the same route, you know, buying content content like Activision Blizzard games and if that became exclusive that could also be another pull for gamers and those games are about to get big updates for Horizon Forbidden for Horizon Forbidden West uh, God of War Ragnarok and then another Spider-Man game so understandable how that competition works before I let you go I got to ask you about gaming Microsoft says this is going to accelerate plans for cloud gaming Folks in our audience have had mixed opinions about cloud gaming in general. Lucas wrote his experience was exceedingly bad. Even with a good internet connection, the latency, the delay, is still noticeable and makes any games that depend on quick reactions significantly more difficult to play and enjoy. And that's ignoring that one in four households that don't have internet. Chris wrote, dislike. Every cloud gaming solution I've tried is not fun to play. Latency is significant. Even if I'm streaming just from my computer to a TV 10 feet away, the latency makes the experience unenjoyable. Shannon, before I have to let you go, these video games are gigantic computer files. I remember how much trouble I had trying to play Cyberpunk 2077 when it dropped for the PS4 and wanted to throw my PS4 through a wall. I mean, just the game by itself. Add into that, making sure you have a connection that, fingers crossed, stays strong enough to play the game, but I see where the technology is going and connections are just going to speed up over time. What's your read of how the cloud is going to change the way we game before we go? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the people that have been writing in, you know, having problems with cloud gaming, that's a like big reason why cloud gaming is not the dominant way that people play games. And it's, you know, it's supposed to be the Netflix of games that you can just quickly open a game and access it, which would be a, a dream. And then it would make gaming much more accessible for people. But we're just not there yet for the technology and, and the internet is just not there for everyone. But I would say that, you know, Cyberpunk 2077, that example that you brought up, um, I've actually heard people playing Cyberpunk using cloud gaming, using Google Stadia, and not finding any bugs at all. And they're actually having an enjoyable experience. So it, it seems like you know cloud gaming does have a couple of great examples. If you have good enough internet and the tools to use it, then you can actually uh, really have a nice game without running into bugs. Um, but it's just situational right now. It's kind of like virtual reality. You know, Headsets are so expensive and, and people can't really reach them. Um, not everyone can have one. So that's also a limited uh, use case. And just like 8K TVs, we also don't see that everywhere either, and they're very expensive. Maybe you right. know next year, the years after, they'll get cheaper and we'll have more cloud gaming uh, across the board. And Sony and Xbox are all investing in cloud gaming, so we might see more of that for sure. I'm gonna try not to be hateful and spiteful that other people had a good experience playing Cyberpunk and I had my experience playing Cyberpunk. I'm gonna try to let that go. Shannon Liao of the Washington Post, I appreciate you making time to talk to us about this. Thank you very much. One more story, one more update to a story from last night. You may remember we talked about America's blood donation crisis. I shared my own experiences with blood donation, namely that as a gay man, I have to wait three months to donate, three months of celibacy because of a long-standing HIV prevention policy. The story resonated with quite a lot of you who shared your stories. Here are a few of them. Aaron wrote, I can't believe that we still have this kind of lack of understanding and lack of sensitivity in 2022, but who would have thought a life-saving vaccine would be political either? As always, thank you for bringing this story to our attention, despite the hurt it brings you. Bruce writes, my gay friends are some of the most generous men and women I know. I was a regular donor until they changed the rules. It was even worse to have the rug pulled out from under me. My decision to come out in the 70s was marred by a nun telling me they no longer wanted my blood. 
And Noel tweeted, I'm a medical laboratory scientist and I've been so angry about this policy since my blood bank training. Thank you so much for speaking out about it. I hope that science and compassion went out and the LGBTQ plus community is able to donate. Thank you for sharing your stories. As always, we appreciate you being a part of the conversation. And hey, I hope it changes too, considering that my blood type is O negative. Anyone could receive my blood if blood banks would take it. Now, we have asked the FDA to join the conversation, and that invitation stands. But in the meantime, we still have a very serious blood shortage in this country. So please, if you're able to donate, do so. Go to aabb.org. Get over your fear of needles. You could save a life. Go to americasblood.org or redcrossblood.org. Also, a study is underway to research changing this FDA blood donation policy. It's called the Advanced Study. And you can learn more about it online at advancedstudy.org. An extremely dangerous situation. That is how the White House describes the Russian troop buildup on the Ukrainian border. Will diplomacy win out or is an invasion just a matter of time? We'll get into that when we come back. The United States is sending its top diplomat to Ukraine. Tensions are rising with Russia, and some Western nations are worried about an invasion. Tomorrow, Secretary of State Antony Blinken plans to meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Later this week, he will meet with Russia's top diplomat, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, in Switzerland. Right now, U.S. intelligence is watching this Russian military buildup, including in Belarus, just north of Ukraine. Belarus and Russia say they are rehearsing joint exercises against potential outside attacks. Ukraine sees it as a prelude to an invasion. Today, the White House warned of an imminent attack and urged a diplomatic solution. So let's be clear. Our view is this is an extremely dangerous situation. We're now at a stage where Russia could at any point launch an attack in Ukraine. Uh, and what Secretary Blinken is going to go do uh, is highlight very clearly there is a diplomatic path forward. Now, clearly, we are talking about Ukraine differently these days. And speaking of how we talk about it, this might need clarifying. Just as a sidebar, is it Ukraine or the Ukraine? And what about the capital? How do you pronounce that? Well, the Russian pronunciation, just FYI, is Kiev. But Ukrainians tend to say Kiev. And after the Soviet Union fell, Ukraine lost its definite article, the. So it's not the Ukraine anymore, just Ukraine. If only the rest of this situation was as easy to clarify. But Michael McFall is here to help with that. He's an NBC News national security and international affairs analyst and the former U.S. ambassador to Russia. Ambassador McFall, welcome back. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. And thanks for doing that little first lesson of all, on I got, Ukraine versus not uh, Ukraine. Yeah, I was just going to ask. First of all, I got that right, right? You did, and it's very important okay. to Ukrainians. So thanks for doing that. Okay. Well, and that kind of gets me into a piece of this issue, which is how Ukrainians view their future and how Russians view the future of this country. These little linguistic things, they've got a larger knock-on meaning. Whose imperatives, whose vision for the future of Ukraine seems to be winning out right now? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I think, generally speaking, Ukrainians today, the independent state of Ukraine, has gone through a, a rebirth of the nation because Russia invaded. Uh, before, before 2014, before they invaded in 2014, there was some ambiguity about the things you were just talking about, right? There are many ethnic Russians in Ukraine. There are many Russian speakers in Ukraine. Vladimir Putin, of course, believes that Ukraine does not and should not exist as a country because Ukrainians, in his view, are part of one nation, Russians and Ukrainians together. But today, that has been defined in a very different way because of that military intervention. And that's what drives Putin nuts. He doesn't want Ukraine to be independent. And he also doesn't want Ukraine to be a democracy. Talk to me about what happens now. We had Biden and Putin. They talked. Then you had the number two diplomats from the U.S. and Russia. They talked, as well as NATO. They talked. Now you've got the number one diplomats from the U.S. and Russia. They're going to talk. But does this mean that we are escalating toward the end of diplomacy, or do diplomatic talks kind of go back and forth? I'm just wondering if I should view this as a linear progression of talks 
or if it tends to bounce around more than that? Honestly, Joshua, I don't know. And President Biden doesn't know, and Secretary Blinken doesn't know, Sergei Lavrov, uh, the foreign minister, he doesn't know. Uh, CIA Director uh, Burns, he doesn't know. The only person that knows the answer to your question is Vladimir Putin. And my guess is he hasn't been asked to be on your show and he wouldn't show up. And that's exactly what Putin wants. So, so there was a law of that diplomatic effort last week, you know, multilateral, uh, bilateral meetings. And at the end of the day, the Russian position hasn't changed. Uh, and that makes everybody nervous, as you just played that clip, uh, that clip from Jen Psaki. Uh, the White House is rightly nervous that after all of that effort, he hasn't changed his position. But we don't know if that's his final position. And, and I applaud what Secretary Blinken is doing to try to take another bite at the apple to meet with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov to see, to figure out, does Putin want to negotiate in a genuine conversation about European security, including Ukraine. And if he does, it's very clear to me the Biden administration is ready to do that. But they don't know. This all could be ultimatums ultimately leading as a pretext to war. So let's talk about how the U.S. might respond to this. The Russian embassy in Kyiv has begun moving some of its staff out. Depending on who you ask, that might be a precaution ahead of an invasion to get them out of there. Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey was on MSNBC today, and he was asked how the U.S. might respond to this, depending on what happens from here. Here's part of what he said. Watch. What Putin is trying to do, if he does it, if he does it, uh, is something that runs totally contrary to what the people of Ukraine want to see happen. So um, I'm ready to vote for the toughest possible sanctions uh, okay. against Russia and to keep them on the books as long as possible. If they take this step, he just has to know that that is what the price that the Russian economy is going to pay for an indefinite period of time if they do this. So before I have to let you go, talk about what the possible U.S. responses look like on the ground in Ukraine. We're not talking about the U.S. getting involved militarily right. with boots on the ground in terms of whatever right. happens between Russia and Ukraine. But what do you see in terms of how the U.S. aligns its interest with Ukraine and the smartest path forward, especially if Putin's like, we're not talking anymore and I'm sending troops in? Well, I think you'll see three different kinds of, of, of actions by the Biden administration. One, you'll see more military assistance to Ukraine. They're already providing a lot. They'll provide more. Two, you'll see NATO troops in NATO countries, not to Ukraine. Thank you for me being very clear about that. But in other NATO countries moving closer to the Russian border. And third, you'll see the most comprehensive sanctions that they can put together. Now, I, I would say to Senator Markey and others, you know, pass the legislation now to give the president the authority to do it if there is a war. It's kind of weird. We're, we're still having negotiations over legislation. Give him those authorities now. But there's a big wild card in all this. Between doing nothing and marching soldiers all the way to Kiev, notice I said it the right way, um, there's a lot of different options that Putin can do. He can use cyber attacks. He can use artillery attacks, air attacks maybe seize territory in the eastern Ukraine, Donbass. Um, and it, when it's in that gray area, then it's going to be a lot harder to keep America's allies, European allies, together with us with comprehensive uh, actions, especially economic sanctions. Ambassador Michael McFall, always appreciate you talking this through with us. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. The New York Times is looking to diversify its editorial staff, specifically the folks who write the crossword puzzles. What does it take to craft those clues, and how would more diversity improve the puzzles? We'll show you before we go. All right, let's play a word game. I am thinking of a 14-letter word, 14 letters, that starts with C. Here's your clue. Crossword champion, 14 letters, starts with C. Crossword champion. The answer, cruciverbalist. Merriam-Webster defines cruciverbalist, yes, it's a real word, as a person who is skillful in creating or solving crossword puzzles. Cruciverbalist, try throwing that out at Scrabble next time. But 
The New York Times is looking for more of them. The games department is diversifying its designers. The goal is to mentor up and coming crossword constructors, especially women, people of color, and LGBTQIA people. Diversity has come up for years as an issue in the crossword community. Back in 2019, one New York Times crossword answer was also an ethnic slur against Mexicans. Editor Will Shorts apologized, writing in part, quote, my feeling, rightly or wrongly, is that any benign meaning of a word is fair game for a crossword. He added, quote, perhaps I need to rethink this opinion if enough solvers are bothered, unquote. So the goal is to shake up the clues and the answers, as well as the people editing and creating them. So what does it take to make a crossword? And how do you make a really good one, especially with certain apps? competing for our attention. Joining us now is Everdeen Mason, the editorial director of games at the New York Times. Ms. Mason, welcome. Glad to have you with us. Hi, thanks for having me. How did this effort to diversify the crossword come about? I mean, it's something that they wanted. I think it's also why they hired me. Um, I started um, about this time last year. Um, and it was something I wanted to do really early on. Um, it was one of the things that um, I said I would do. Like that's like the main thing I want to do. So um, after a couple of months of really getting to know the lay of the land, you know, I'm really new to this community. Um, I had made it, never made a crossword on my own. Um, so getting to know the times, getting to know all my editors um, and getting to know more about the community once I kind of felt like I had that under my belt and we were able to start working on figuring out the best way to kind of bring more diverse voices on, onto our pages. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but um, you know, every single one of our crosswords is made by an everyday human. They submit through an, you know, an open submissions platform. Um, so my thought was, okay, how do I get uh, more people who might be like myself um, to be submitting crosswords to us? And then right. once we get them in the pipeline, how do we make sure that they have all the tools that they need to be able to actually competitively submit to us? So that's kind of how did you say did you say earlier forgive me if I misheard you did you say earlier that before you joined you had not made crosswords before did I hear that right no. yes you did so what drew yes, you to you wanting to oversee the team that makes crosswords like what what drew you to that it sounded like a lot of fun um I think my background is really um been working in news for a long time um I'm really passionate about building digital products um thinking about audiences first, thinking about the best way to communicate with people, however that may be. Um, I also have a deep love of language, so it seems like a natural fit. Um, so yeah, and it, it's been really great so far. Um, I'm having a really great time with the team. A few more things. I, I know my time with you is real brief, but a few more things. How will you measure success with this effort? Are you trying to recruit a certain number of cruciverbalists to the stable of people you rely on? Is it the kinds of clues you get? Are there a certain number of puzzles you're trying to produce with this group? Like, what's your what's your benchmark for success? Yeah, so again, this is our first time doing this, so it'll be an iterative process. Uh, we will have five fellows um, for this first round and see how that feels with a team. Um, and my goal is to publish all five fellows. Um, what would be really successful to me is obviously if lots of people apply, um, but also if we just get some really cool puzzles out of this. Um, I wanna see really different fill um, than we typically get. Um, there's a lot of things that are just codified in crossword construction now because you know this is a product that's existed for a really long time. Um, so yeah. debut words, getting different cultural reference points um, where the cluing and the context behind it feels really authentic um, and not overly explaining it, you know, to an audience that we might other those cultures. Um, so, you know, my hope is just that we, we get to publish all five and it'll be a really good experience for the editors too, um, to get to work one-on-one -on -one with different groups of people and help them build from the ground up. Um, every single one of our editors is like an incredible constructor in their own right. So I think that this will yeah. be a really good match for the one. Before I have to let you go, any concern about the rise of games like Wordle pulling away people's attention for word games? No, there's room for us all. Um, I think I think there's plenty of room. Wordle's a really different game than obviously a crossword or a spelling bee. Um, and I think 
it would be really nice for people to have a daily habit with all of these puzzles. And, and how do people apply for the fellowship if they want to, to throw their hat in the ring? Yeah, so we're going to open submissions officially um, on March 7th, and the submissions will be open for a month. Um, we are accepting applications for themed puzzles. For that, you only need to send us a themed set. So that'll probably be four, five long answers. I'm um, in the clues. If you want to submit a theme list, we do need to see a little piece of a grid. Um, so we ask that you submit maybe a corner or a seven by seven. Um, and all the instructions will be on the submission form when we open it. But that, that's the big thing, you know, passion um, and having some good clues and some really cool answers for the theme. And finally, last few seconds before I let you go, what is your one strongest tip for crafting a great clue, briefly? Oh my gosh, for a great clue? I mean, well, we like things that are fun, <laughs> things that are really witty. Um, I think whatever your natural word association is, and then twist it. Um, I think that's how we end up yeah. with some really cool doing. Everdeen Mason from the New York Times, I appreciate you coming on to talk to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And hey, thank you for making time for us tonight. Tomorrow night, we'll be talking about another kind of inclusion involving black women. You may have heard last week, the U.S. Mint released a commemorative quarter to honor Maya Angelou. Also, Mattel recently put out a Barbie doll honoring the pioneering journalist Ida B. Wells. We will speak to Wells' granddaughter, Michelle Duster, about that process tomorrow night. But in the meantime, we want to hear from you. Where have you seen your culture reflected in pop culture lately? What stood out and what did you think of it? We're at NBC Now tonight on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC. That's 888-575-2622. Or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. So until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.